So this week we're going to get loopy. Um, and what in the world does that mean? We're going to learn how to make the same decision repeatedly. Doesn't make a lot of sense yet, but it will once we go through things. Whoops. I should be playing and I should not have done that. All right, there we go. So, code reusability. It's not something that a lot of programming classes talk about, but it is massively important in programming. Um, what is code reusability? And I don't mean copying and pasting. It's using loops and functions and other forms of reusable code to essentially write less code, to um, allow you to use the same block of code and get different answers based on the data that you send it. Functions do that. Loops do it. They do it repeatedly. Um, and when we get to week eight and we're talking about objects and classes, that's another big way to do reusability. Um, so every amount of code that you write as a programmer has to be maintained by you or by someone else. Um, I'm human. I don't always do everything perfectly. I try really hard to. doesn't always get there. So um, when you are coding, you have to be cognizant of the fact that somebody's paying you and that you want your code to be as efficient as, and as effective as possible. When it gets to efficient, it's how, how little code can I write that actually does what I need? I don't want to write voluminous amounts of code. I want to write the least code possible to get the job done. And I also want to write it in a way that it's driven by the data that it gets. Okay? So, and we'll, we'll go into this a little bit tonight, and I'll talk a little bit more about data-driven code, because that's really what it is you want to write. There is a metric that goes like this when it comes to the cost of finding an error in code. If you find it in requirements, it costs you a dollar. If you find it in design, it costs you 10. If you find it in coding, it costs you 100. And if you find it after it's gotten to the customer, it costs you 1,000. So if we create reusable code, we are less likely to have bugs because we're writing less code. And I know people, are, people can say, but you're a programmer, you're paid to write code. Yes, I am. I am paid to write code as efficiently and as effectively as possible. So we got some new keywords this week. We have while, which is one of our keywords for a loop. We have for, which is another keyword for a loop. We have in, which basically it's made for sequences. Sequences of numbers, sequences of whatever. N is made for sequences. And this will become very, very important when we start using lists. For and in are the best way to handle a list. While, the while loop, you're going to have to use for your project. It's going to be the main game playing loop, and you're going to use while for it. Break says stop the loop and back out, just stop. And continue says, yeah, don't go any further, go back to the top. And we're going to look at examples of all of those. So some new concepts. Iteration. An iteration is the execution of a block of Python statements within the loop until an exit condition is met. So however many times you go through that loop, is the number of iterations. So one time through the loop is one iteration. Second time through the loop is the second iteration. There's also something called a sentinel value. This is usually used with while loops. 
and it basically it determines when the loop is going to stop because you don't want your root loops to run forever. You want to control how they run. And some loops are going to run for a long time and some you don't want to. So the Sentinel value will help you control a while loop. And that is another important thing that you're going to need for your game. Okay, so we're going to start with while loops. The basics of a while loop is very simple. So first of all, I define this variable called test. And I just set test equal to go. I could have set test equal to x. And it wouldn't have mattered. The only way it will matter is if I set it to q. Because if I look at my while statement, it says while test not equal q. Now, we can, last week, we talked about if statements and how they were true-false questions. Loops are true-false questions as well. In fact, they're an extension of a conditional expression. Last week, we, we just said, you know, when it, when it turns out to be true, do this block of code. If it doesn't turn out to be true, do this other block of code. While the same thing happens with loops, it's just happening repeatedly. So instead of if test is not the same as the letter Q, which would just allow the print and the test to run once, we use the while loop. And it will allow it to run until somebody puts in a letter Q. So it's kind of a way to relate it to what we learned last week. So the sentinel value here is test. Test is what will allow you to enter the loop. So test is go. So if I look at the while statement, I say while test is not Q. So I can say test is not Q, true or false. Since test is go, it is not Q, and it will then move on to that print line. And it will keep going until someone hits Q. Now, why did I set test equal to go? I could have set test equal to anything other than Q, and it would execute what's in the while loop. So go, there's no special meaning in go. It could have been X. I could have made it Fred. But it is just a way to allow you to enter into a while loop. So while's our keyword. It tells Python we're going to make a decision repeatedly. Test is our sentinel value. They are, in fact, the same. I have a conditional operator, just like I had with if statements, same conditional operators, because they are, in fact, a form of conditional statement. Q is the sentinel value. It says this is when you stop. And um, you can read that while loop as, as long as test is not equal to Q, keep going. And then I have my block. Now we talked about scope last week. We talked about local scope and global scope. That print statement under the while loop and the test are indented one to the right, which means they are inside the scope of the while loop. And what happens, and this is important for, for you guys to understand, because you're going to need this for your game. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to print out what test was the last time it was put in. Then I'm going to get the value of test again. This is inside the loop changing the value that we're going to test against the sentinel when we go back up to the top of the while loop. So with a while loop, it's important that inside the loop you change the value that we're testing. There's a reason that I've got test in the while loop and test down here on the input, and that is because they have to be the same. This is data driven. I am taking a piece of information that is changing inside the loop and I'm using that changed piece of information to test what to do when it comes to controlling the loop. 
Okay, so here are just some rules. Sentinel is a value which defines the actual condition of a loop. In our case, it's the letter Q. A while loop will execute until the sentinel value reaches the exit condition. Uh, this loop will run and run and run until I put in this, a single letter Q, lowercase, because it is case sensitive. Like all conditional statements, a while statement must end with a colon. Don't forget the colon. And don't forget to indent it properly either. Okay, so we're just going to run through this as a test. So test right now is go. So what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to type in hello, and hello is going to go back up to the top of the loop. It's going to be evaluated against Q. Now I've just completed an iteration. And then I'm going to test it again. Test is the value of hello. Hello is not Q. So you execute the code inside the while loop. So I'm going to print out what my input was and then I'm going to reassign test inside the loop to whatever Professor Lisa puts in the next time. And this time I'm going to put in Q. Q will be basically because it's in test will be um, evaluated in the while loop and because test is Q, and Q is the sentinel value, we exit the loop. Each trip through that loop is called an iteration. And we did two iterations, two full iterations of the loop. Um, and that's important to know. You have to understand what's happening each time you go through the loop because the data is changing. Just like test changed, I started out at go at the very beginning, because that's what I set it to, and then the first time through the loop, I put in hello, and the second time through the loop, I put in Q. So there were two complete iterations through the loop, which means that the code underneath that while loop, the code in the local scope of the while loop, got fully executed twice. And am I missing any questions yet? Hold on. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't look quickly enough. Okay. Everybody good with sound? I hope so. Okay. So let's go back to this. And cool. Okay, so this is just really quick. I wanted you to see what a, a, for, a while loop looks like in a flowchart because you might need this someday. Um, so basically you have start, test equal go. Um, you have an if statement. You will notice there is no while. There's, the word while is nowhere in this flowchart. And that's because Using while would make the loop language specific or multi-language specific. And flowcharts are language agnostic. So how do I represent that whole concept of a loop? Well, I do it based on the type of de the decision that it's making. So assuming test not equal to Q is true, I'm going to output test, I'm going to input the test, and then I'm going to go back to the decision. So that's what the loop looks like in a flowchart. And we break out of that loop when if test not equal Q returns false. Or in other words, when test is the single letter, lowercase Q. Okay. Oh, I'm not playing again. Goodness. What is wrong with my brain today? All right. Let's do this. Okay, I think I just went through that. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we're going to follow the test. So Professor Lisa, she's inputting hello. Hello is not the same as Q, so we're going to output hello. We're going to input it. Professor Lisa is going to go Q. We're going to go back up. We're going to test 
that Q is not equal to Q, that is false, which means we're going to exit the loop. Okay, so actually I'm going to go into PyCharm. Oops. Okay, that was just the thumbs up. Okay, I'm going to go into PyCharm now, and we're going to look at some loops. Um, a simple while loop. Okay, so this looks very much like what we just did. But I want to show you a couple of things. Um, first of all, yeah, we're just going to run it or debug it because you know me. I do love the debugger. Okay, simple while. Okay. So what we're doing here is we just got a, a really small while loop. And we're going to have a sentinel value of y. We're going to have our variable that we're going to use to test against, which is user care. Could have been anything, I just named it user care. So if I debug, I have my breakpoint online one. And as we can see, there are no variables yet. So I'm going to step over and I have user care is the string go. Now here I have my while test. Now go is not the same as y. So this statement's going to evaluate to true. At the point at which it evaluates to true, I enter the local scope of that while loop. I'm going to print out the value of user care, and then it's going to wait for input, and I'm going to put in hello because I have no imagination tonight. And so now user care is hello. Hello is not the same as why. I enter into the loop. I can see over here in my variables that user care is hello. It printed out that I entered hello. And now it's waiting for me to enter something. So I'm going to enter y. I am now up at the top of the loop. And the handy dandy thing here about PyCharm is you can um, mouse over the Boolean operator. And when you do that, it will tell you what that's about to evaluate true to. So this is going to evaluate defaults, which means I will not be executing lines 4 and 5, but instead I go to line 7, which says I'm done. So that's just a simple while loop, and here are some of the gotchas. Um, of course, the colon. If I run it without the colon, it's going to tell me. Now, here's something that people do a little, that, that I see them do on their projects. This is not going to give you a syntax error, but what it is going to do is it's going to run forever. Why is it going to run forever? Because nothing changes user care. So just so it doesn't run forever, I'm going to do that, and I'll show you what happens. So user care is go. That's fine. Go is not why. I'm going to... Output, you entered go. Now it goes back up to the top of the loop. It didn't ask us to input user care. And it didn't ask us because user care is not inside the local scope of the loop. And it's not because it didn't get indented one to the right. So if I left it like this, we would just keep going until all the RAM in my, in my computer were chewed up. But that's, so that's why I put the breakpoint there. The way to avoid this is tab that to the right. And then when you do it, we will be asked the question. And I will input Q here, just because we don't need to run through it again. And then I go up to the top of the loop. Q is the same. Sorry, sorry. I put in Q. I meant to put in Y. So let's put in Y, and 
we're going to be done. So that is why it is very, very important to make sure that when you're changing this value, you're doing it inside the loop. That was not a syntax error. That was a logic error. And logic errors can be much more difficult to figure out than syntax errors. Okay. So oftentimes we have to count. We're, we're trying to do something some number of times. We want to do it three times or we want to do it ten times. So we have to learn how to count inside of a while loop. Now this gets easier when you go to for loops because for loops were made for counting. Um, so what do I have here? Well, I have a value called counter. It's my test value. I'm going to use that test value and I'm going to evaluate it against three. And my evaluation is going to be counter is less than three, true or false. So basically what happens is every time you go through the loop, you're expected to increment counter. So by incrementing counter, I mean I'm going to set counter equal counter plus one. That's all I'm doing. I'm just adding one to it every time I hit the bottom of that loop. And what this does is it allows you to have, instead of expecting someone to enter something that terminates the while loop, you have a predetermined termination. So I'm only going to do this loop three times. And I'm going to make sure I only do it three times because my sentinel value is going to be three. And I'm going to have a less than. So I know that as long as I'm incrementing my counter, and here counter equal counter plus one is the increment, um, that I'm only going to run through this loop three times. I don't have to worry about what a user inputs. It's just going to happen that way. And that's very useful. And in for loops, we'll also see that it's very useful because when we start dealing with for loops and lists and dictionaries, um, and you're going to need all of those. So let's do while count. And by the way, as usual, all of these um, will be up uh, in the description. There'll be a link to the Google Drive. So here, I just have n equal 10. Now I could have had a user input here, which may happen in a lab. Um, I've got some counter. I'm going to start counter at 0. So I'm going to say, well, counter is less than or equal to n. I'm going to print it out. I'm going to increment it. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop until I'm all done with the loop. So let's just walk through this a little bit. Uh, while count. And we're just going to debug it so we can walk through this. If I go to my variables, there we are. N is 10 and counter is 0. So let's take a look at what happens when I walk through this. I'm going to print over to the console. Counter is 0. Now I am going to increment counter. So counter equal counter plus 1. Counter is now 1, but counter is, uh, is still less than or equal to N. So I'm going to then go through it again. And we're just going to keep doing this. You'll see the numbers change. And when I, I am now at 10, 10 is still less than or equal to 10. So I'm going to take another trip through the loop. Now counter is 11. 11 is not less than or equal to 10, so I'm all done. So what's important here is that you take this value and you change it. Counter equal counter plus 1, counter equal counter minus 5, whatever it is, you make sure that that value, that, that um, expression is inside the local scope of the while loop because that expression, the one that changes the value that um, you're comparing against the sentinel value, is the thing that's going to keep you from having an infinite loop. And what Zybooks will do is it will give you, I think it's a timeout error. So if you have an infinite loop, Zybooks is going to give you this, I think it's timeout. 
Um, and and it's not going to say really a whole lot, like, hey, you have a um, uh, an infinite loop. It's simply just going to tell you that there was a timeout error. Um, if you're in my class and you get weird errors, as always, email me, and I will do my best to help you determine how to fix that error in your code. Okay, so we're going to go on to for loops. I like for loops. For loops is one of the things that I use most of the time when I am dealing with programming. So for is a keyword, and it says the same thing as while does. It says, hey, Python, make decisions repeatedly. Now, the format of this for loop is different than the while loop because we have this keyword in. And basically, it tells Python, hey, Python, expect a sequence. The thing to the right of me is a sequence. So I have four, and then I have num. Num is just a variable. It's a variable that is created when Python hits this, this statement right here, and it is only available in the local scope of the while loop as long as that while loop is running. After that, it goes away. So this is where in the while loops, we had to have that um, variable defined outside of the while loop that was not inside the local scope. With for loops, we don't have to do that. With for loops, we just have to say for and variable name. And num is not special. It could have been Fred. It could have been um, upside down. It's just a variable name. That's all it is. For is important. For is the keyword. In is another keyword. And what's to the right of in is important. Now, I have a function called range here, and we're actually going to talk about that in a little bit. But basically, what's expected on the right side of the in is a sequence. One, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, E any kind of sequence that you want, and eventually when we get into lists in module six, we're going to see how we can put a, just a whole list right there. Um, and you can read this statement as, as long as num is less than three, keep going. And so then I'm going to print num is format num. This is a code block. It will only be executed three to, if num is less than three. And remember, our sequences are always starting at zero unless we tell it otherwise. And for the way this call to the range function is, it's always going to start at zero. Now, another thing to notice that's different from the while loop is I have two less lines of code. I don't have to define a variable outside or before the for loop. And I don't have to ask a user to input any data to change the value that I'm, I'm testing against the Sentinel value. So for loops are great if you're going over lists. If you are taking user input, you need to use a while. And since your game is taking user input, your main gameplay loop is going to be a while loop. So I'm probably going to say that a lot of times over the next couple of weeks, but this is that's where you have to start with your game play loop. Now you are going to have a for loop in there, but for right now, um, your main game play loop is going to be a while loop. Okay, range is a special function. We'll talk about it in a minute. Like all conditional statement, for station for statement has to end with a colon. And for defines a special value that is only accessible inside the for loop, and that's the variable num. So range. Range is a special function provided by Python. Um, and basically what it does, it creates a sequence. You don't have to write a sequence. It will simply create the sequence for you. Um, so in will determine if the value is contained within the sequence created by range. So if num is 10 and you're looking in range of 3, well, 
10 is not going to be in 0, 1, or 2. Um, and in is often used to iterate through a sequence, and it doesn't just have to be a sequence of numbers. It can be a list. It can be, um, well, it wouldn't be a dictionary, but it can be a list. So let's look at the range function itself. The range function itself is, um, has two optional parameters and one required parameter. So stop is the required one, which is why in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, you just see range, open parenthesis, three, close parenthesis. That is the stop. Now, this is a special function in Python because it can take any number of arguments. We'll learn a little bit more about how it can do that in functions because there are default values. But just suffice it for now to say that start, if you don't put start there, it's always going to start at zero. And if you don't put increment, it's always going to increment by one. So there's lots of cool things you can do with range because you can have it, you know, start at a larger number and increment backwards, which as far as I can recall, is a lab you're going to have to do. Um, so you can do all kinds of things with range. And I think I got them all. Yep. So, and four was made for sequences. So range is just a really good pairing with it. Okay, so we're going to follow the number. See, I don't need a teacher on this one. You can just completely get rid of the teacher. So all that happens is that when Python sees the range function, it's going to create a sequence under the hood. You won't see that, but that's what Python is doing. It's saying, okay, I now have a sequence 0, 1, and 2. So it's going to say num is going to be 0, and then it's going to input num, and then I'm going to up to the top of the loop, and it's going to pull off 1 from that sequence. And then it's going to print out num is 1. And then it's going to go pull off 2 from that sequence. Say num is 2. And then we're done. Because range, the, the stop value for range is not inclusive. So if I put 3 there, it's only going to do 0, 1, and 2. It's not going to do 3. Because I'm looking for three iterations through the loop, and the start is always zero. Yes, it could have been made much easier if things had started at one, but they don't. Um, so always remember that unless you um, define it otherwise, range starts at zero. So when you're looking at that stop value three or ten or whatever it is, it's going to be three times through the loop instead of going until it equals 3. So let's just do 4 with range really quick. One of the reasons I like for loops is, anybody have any questions? I don't think so. One of the reasons I like for loops is because you simply write less code. Part of my loving reusability and not wanting to waste anybody's time or money. Um, there are places where while loops are absolutely required, but there, there's a lot of places, like if you're dealing with a dictionary, if you're getting lots of data out of a dictionary, you're going to have a collection of data that you're going to want to use a for loop for. Anyway, I will stop waxing poetic about for loops and get to this example. Okay. So I am going to debug this. So if I look at variables, I don't have any variables here because I have not entered that for loop. This variable counter does not exist until the first time I execute line two. Since I'm on line two at a breakpoint, it hasn't been executed yet. When I step over, it'll get executed, and now I have counter is zero, and I'm going to print it out, and then I go up to the top of the loop. Counter is still zero, but the minute I step over that line of code, 
counter becomes one. I didn't have to do anything. It just happens because that's what a for loop does. So I'm now going to do the second one. I'm going to do, and it's done. Okay, let's, Kevin, let's do all of the labs afterward, and we can definitely go over that after I finish the lecture, because then we can open up the mics, and you can share things, and I think it'll just be easier. Okay. So, if I go to my flowchart here, and I just wanted to show this on purpose, the uh, what a for loop looks like in a flowchart. And you will find out that this flowchart looks really similar to the flowchart with a while loop. That's because they are. Flowcharts are language agnostic. So a loop is a loop. It's not going to change because you're using a for or a while. It just is going to look like a loop. So again, you can refer back to these if you're dealing with making a flowchart with a while loop. So, and that's what you can see the loop with the arrows. If it's true, it's going to output num, it's going to increment num, and it's going to go back to the if statement. And you're probably saying, but wait a minute, we didn't have to do num equal num plus one at the bottom of that for loop. That is a true statement. We didn't have to program it, but Python does it under the hood. So that's what a for loop looks like, pretty much looks like the same. Um, as a while loop in a flowchart. Okay, so, okay, we're doing okay on time. More about range, and I'm telling you this because you're probably going to have to do some things with range in a lab or two. So, print every other number between 1 and 5 inclusive. So, what does that mean? It means 5 is inclusive which means the range has to stop at 6. And I want to start it at 1, so you'll see range, open parenthesis, 1. That's where I'm going to start it. I'm going to end it at 5, so um, 6 is the stop value. And I'm going to increment it by 2, because it's every other number between 1 and 5. So that means that it starts at 1, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, and then I'm done. So that's what's happening. So I'm going to do 1, go back up to the top of the loop, I get 3 off the sequence, get 5 off the sequence, and I'm done. So that's a little bit more about how to use range. And you can also use this to count backwards. Now, I don't think I have, yeah, I don't have a flow chart. But if you guys want to see how to count backwards later, let me know. Basically, you start at a high number, you end at a lower number, and your increment is a negative number. Oh, done. Okay. You can nest loops. You can nest a for loop in a while loop, a while loop inside of a for loop, for loops inside of for loops. And when we get to lists and multidimensional lists, you're going to have to have a for loop inside of another for loop. So this is what a nested for loop looks like. Well, first of all, I've expanded the program. This is challenge 4.1.3. And I'm going to input rows and columns. Now, there's a reason I'm saying rows and columns here, and that's because matrices, which have rows and columns, um, are often calculated, or often, excuse me, evaluated using for loops. Excuse me, I had to take a little bit of water. Um, so, in this case, I'm making the whole thing data-driven. The user is putting in the number of rows, and the user is putting in the number of columns. And then we're just going to run through it. So 
it, there is no static value. The, the number three is not here. The number can change based on what the user wants it to do. So after the user puts in the rows and the columns, I have two for loops. I have an outer for loop and an inner for loop. And I made the names of the variables outer and inner because I think it's just easier to read. Um, and I'm going to go for the outer loop, I'm going to evaluate the rows. And for the inner loop, I'm going to evaluate the columns. So if you are familiar with an Excel spreadsheet, that's also what we're doing here, rows and columns. And what I want to do is I want to print a star for each row and each column. So I'm going to put in two and two. So on the right hand side, I have put what the each of the individual uh, variables for the loops does. So counter is starting at zero because I have range rows. Now my next step is to go into the for loop for columns. So I am going to go into the for loop for columns. So now I have, I've set my inner variable value to zero. So both zero, zero. And then I'm going to print a star and a space. And so now I go up to the inner loop. I don't go all the way back up to the outer one. I go up to the inner loop. I'm going to stay inside this inner loop until I've done something for the number of columns. So inner equals inner 0 plus 1, which is 1. So I am going to print another star. I'm going to go back up to the inner loop. 1 plus 1 is 2, so I'm done. And so I then print a new line, because that's what that print statement does. And then I go all the way back up to the top, to the outer loop. So you always complete the inner loop before you go back to the outer loop. So now everything that was going on with that inner loop goes away, but not the outer loop. The outer loop stays, and now outer is 1. So I'm going to go back to the inner for loop. So now inner is 0. It starts all the way over again. It's like it never happened on the inner loop. So I'm going to print out another star. I'm going to go up to the columns. Uh, inner is now 1. I'm going to print out another star. I'm going to go up to that, up to the inner loop. Well, I'm not going to do it anymore because now it's going to be 2. I'm going to go up to, sorry, I'm going to print. I'm going to fall out of that loop. I'm going to print. And then after all of that is done, I'm going to go up to the top of the for loop. And that's a lot of work for very few lines of code. Uh, it's another reason why I like for loops. So let's go, what do we have left? OK, so let's go and actually take a look at that. Oops. OK. Challenge 413, are you speaking of Zybooks Chapter 4? I'm not seeing that challenge. Hold on. Oh, maybe it's 4.2.3. Let me look. Zybooks. Oops. Uh, what did I say it was? I said it was uh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm drawing four eight one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yep, nested loops. I appreciate that. Great job, Kevin. Good question, Quentin. Okay, 
So now we're going to talk a little bit about break and continue. So sometimes we don't want to finish the loop. We just want to stop. It's just like, you know, okay. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Um, so sometimes we just want to stop. You don't need to run the loop any longer. And so how do we do that? Well, we use the break command, the break keyword. And break basically says stop here, just exit out of the loop, just stop. Now, this is going to be important. Um, is it going to be, you're going to have to use a break? You won't have to use a break in your game. Um, but it's important anyway to learn about how to manipulate lit, how to manipulate loops. You don't always want to have to execute everything all the time in a loop. There may be a time when you just want to stop the loop. You want to just get out of that loop and be done with it. And the break command is how you do it. When you hit the break command, so we have a test. The test is just an empty string. Somebody's going to input test. I'm going to, Professor Lee's going to input 42. If time is in test, which is not, else if 42 is in test, that's true, so I'm going to print right answer, and then I'm going to break. And what break does is it goes outside the loop because the next um, condition outside the loop is print done, and that's it. It's done with the loop. So let's actually see that in code. Okay, so that was break. So here's break.py, just like we saw. And I wanted to make sure that you guys understood what it meant to break out of the loop and what's going to happen. So I'm going to just set this up real quick. Okay. So I'm going to go into the debugger. I've got my variables up. So I have test is a um, empty space. I'm going so I, I go inside the loop because test is not the same as done, and it's going to ask for my input. I want to say what is the answer. I'm going to say the answer is 42, and then I'm going to evaluate. Now you'll notice that I have if statements inside of a while loop, and I can also have them inside the for loops. I can have a for loop inside of an if statement. You can mix and match this stuff forever. Okay, so time is not in test because test is 42. So I'm going to say, okay, my next, um, not, my next evaluation is, is 42 in test. Well, 42 is in fact in test. So it's going to print right answer, and then it's going to immediate, when it goes to the break statement, it's not going to do anything else. That, that's like the, um, that when you land on the jail thing, and you have to go straight, and Monopoly, and you have to go straight to jail, and you can't collect $200, that's what the break statement is. So I'm going to go all the way to line 11. It didn't even look at lines 9 and 10, because it hit the break statement. And the other side of that is the continue statement. So sometimes you want to stop what you're doing, but you don't want to end the loop. That's what continue does. Continue says, okay, go back up to the top of the loop. I'm done here. I'm just done. But I don't want to stop the loop. I want to go back up to the top of the loop and reevaluate what's next. You'll often find this when you're dealing with lists or large data sets. Based on where you are in the data set, what you're doing, you will often find that people say, okay, I don't need to do anything else here, so I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop and look at the next thing. So also in this continue.py, we're using some of our splits and joins that we already talked about. I think it was in two when we talked about lists a little bit and strings. Um, 
So basically I have my stir equals and it's just string one space and space two space and space three. And I'm going to split that into a list, which means that I'm going to have a list that has five elements. And I want to only deal with those elements. I only want to print the elements that are not and. So I have a for loop. That for loop has a variable item. Okay, so here's the split. I get one and two and three. And so four has an item. An item is just a variable name in my list. So the first thing that's going to happen is item is going to equal one. And then I'm going to test, is item the same as and? If item is not the same as and, then I'm going to jump down to the else statement. I'm going to print out the item and end with a comma. I'm going to go up to the top of the loop. Now I'm going to get and. So what happens? Item becomes and. Whoops. Okay. Because item is and, I'm going to continue. I'm not going to do any printing. I'm going to go right up to the top of the loop. Item is two, so it's going to be very much like when it was one. Item is not and, so it's going to print it. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. Item is and. Everything else goes away. I look at item. Item is and. I continue. Go back up to the top of the loop. Then item is going to be three. Everything else goes away. So item is three is not equal to and, so I'm going to print it and be done. Okay. So, okay, we're doing pretty good. We got time. You know, I was going to go over, but these flow charts are messy. So I'm going to bring up the pseudocode for this. Okay, so here is the pseudocode for the labs. Lab 4.14, 4.15, 4.16, and 4.17. Um, now, in pseudocode, you can actually, there's nothing wrong with putting the kind of loop that you're using, at least um, the pseudocode that I have written. So basically, you're given a line of text as input, and I'll put the number of characters excluding spaces periods or commas. So since you're being given a line of text, which means a string, and a string is a sequence of characters, we can use the for loop. Um, and what we want to do is we're just going to say for each character in whatever somebody put in. So the variable's name is user text. Um, I'm going to input whatever it is that, that I'm going to input. And then I can just go into my for loop. And so basically what this is going to do is it's going to evaluate every single character in user text. And I can say, okay, if it's not equal to space and it's not equal to a dot and it's not equal to a comma, then I'm going to increment my care count. Now, something to be notice here. I set care count outside of the for loop. That's because I want to use it later outside the for loop. Just like with if and else and elif statements, if I define the variable inside the local scope, then it's only available in that local scope. So I have to define it in the global scope. So care count is defined in the global scope on purpose. And that's so later on when I'm inside the global scope and I'm outside of the local scope of the for loop, I can in fact print it out. So um, that's lab 4.14. And it really is just those few lines of code. So this is another one that we're dealing with a sequence of characters. Um, however, we're going to be combining that in different ways. First of all, what we're going to do is we're going to take any instance of um, I and change it to an exclamation point, and A and change it to at, and M change it to capital M, B to eight, and O to dot. So we're going to modify some things 
in a string. But wait a minute, we can't modify a string. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a list. And we're going to, sorry, we're going to create an empty string called password. And what we're going to do is we're going to either substitute, and then if there's nothing to substitute, we just put the character in. We're going to increment the counter. This is one of those times when a while loop is a good idea. And then we're going to go back up to the top of the loop and we're going to evaluate the next character. And we're going to keep evaluating characters until we've gotten through all the characters of the string. And then before I output it, I have to add Q star S to the end. So don't forget to add Q star S to the end. There are students who don't get credit sometimes because they forget to do that. So that is just string manipulation using a while loop. So it doesn't matter if the, the input is four characters or 100 characters. This will always act correctly for each individual character. OK, uh, 4.16. Uh, let me go look at what 4.16 is. I have drawn a blank. Okay, so lab 4.16. There we go. Okay, drawing a right triangle. This really freaks people out. But it is very, very doable because this is nested loops. Okay, you have a height and a width. And in this case, the height and width are the same. But you need to have a nested loop to do this properly. OK. So that's the trick to this one, is making sure that you have a nested for loop. Where am I? Here am I. OK. So what we have is I have whiles here. You could just as easily done a for loop. Um, this is while counter is less than the height. So we have somebody putting in a height and somebody putting, um, sorry, we put in a character and a height and then we have a counter. So basically I have these nested loops. Just like I had row and column before, if you look at uh, this, this is rows and columns, okay? This is the first row and it only shows one. And this is the second row and it shows two. And that's the third row and it shows three. All the way up to the fifth row, which shows five. So I have two counters, an outer counter and an inner, sorry, an outer loop and an inner loop. I have counter. While counter is less than height, height can be whatever is put in. It's data driven. So it can be five or it can be 55. Um, and then if I set inner counter equals zero, because I need to control the inside counter. Now, if you do this with a for loop, Python will do it for you. Um, and that's going to be less than or equal to counter. So what I'm doing is I am planning my inner loop based on what's happening in my outer loop. So as long as the inner counter is less than or equal to the counter, the outer counter, I'm going to output a care, and I'm going to set inner counter equal inner counter plus one, and I'm going to go back up to the loop, and I'm going to do it again, and then when this loop finishes, when inner counter is no longer less than or equal to counter, then what's going to happen is it's going to drop out of that loop, it's going to print a space, and it's going to increment the outer counter, and it's going to do it all again. And it's going to do that for every time, for every, every um, between zero and height, every number between zero and height. So that's 4.16. A lot of people get confused on this because they don't look at using nested loops. But for 4.16, you have to use nested loops. There's no way to do it otherwise. So 4.17, um, this is just, let's go back and look at that. I should have put those on there. 4.17, 4 
So basically what you're doing is you're just replacing um, you're replacing uh, characters in a sentence. So you're going to put in apples five, shoes two, quit zero, and you're going to, the output's going to be five apples a day, keeps the doctor away, two shoes a day, keeps the doctor away, and quit and zero are to stop the loop. So when you see this here, you've got a while loop, and quit and zero will stop that loop, or actually quit will stop the loop. So here I'm going to input a word, and then I'm going to um, input then split the tokens. I say while tokens of zero is not equal to quit, because remember what you're inputting is you're inputting two pieces of information. Sorry, wrong thing. You're inputting two pieces of information. You're putting inputting apples and five. So you have to split them into two. And so you're going to have a list with apples comma five. So you can use it like a list. Um, wrong one again. Sorry, people. There we go. All right, so I have tokens of zero, which is going to be my word. If my word is not quit, then I'm going to output eating tokens of one, which is the number. So this would be, if it were apples, that would be, tokens of one would be five, and token, excuse me, tokens of zero would be, would be apple. A day keeps the doctor away. I'm then going to ask for new input. I'm going to say, okay, now give me a word and another number, and then I'm going to do the split again. I go up to the top of the loop as long as token of zero is not quit I'm going to go back through this loop and I'm just going to keep doing that so that is 4.17 okay does anybody have any questions please feel free to open up your mic and we will go take a look at things Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, who's Kevin? You're breaking up a little. Is this Kevin? Yeah. Okay. You were breaking up a little. Um, yeah, sorry. I don't know what's wrong with my computer. That's I'm okay. Not really working on my um, two questions on the left. Um, I'm just wondering if you use a different method to solve these labs, is that okay? Um, can you say that again? I really am having trouble because it's breaking up. So it's I got like every other word. Um, if you use a different um, way solving a lab, is that okay? I got, if you use a different, and then what was the word after different? <laughs> I still didn't get, type it into the chat. Oh, if you use a different method than, which method? Yes, I don't have a problem with it. I can't speak to another um, professor, but as far as I'm concerned, if the um, if the lab works, the lab works. And if you can go out to python.doc or something and find something that makes it better and easier, I applaud that. So go right ahead. You can use whatever method you find that makes sense to you to solve the labs. The What I provide you is what I think makes sense. But if you have a better way or a different way and it gets the right answer, then you get, then, then go for it. 
Okay. And is it okay if I share a code that doesn't work for one of you? Okay. You can do that. I think most of the people have left anyway. So, um, yes, absolutely. Why don't you copy the code or show me a picture of the code and we'll see what we can do. I'll see if I can get you moving. So which lab is this for? Four, three, one, seven. Okay. Just going back and familiarizing myself. So this is the Mad Lib. All right. Okay. We have user items. Okay. So you're doing two different user inputs. Now, one of the things that you're going to have a problem with here is that Zybooks is only going to give you a single line of code. Okay? So Zybooks is not going to give you two different user entries. It's going to give you one, which is why you have to have, why you have to split it and then use the two different values from the list that's created from the split. Oh, because then every time I entered <laughs> yeah. So what the over here, like Apple Space Five, that's all you're getting. You're not getting apples, and then some. Then Zybooks is um, using a robot to hint the enter key, and then giving you five. It's giving you Apple Space Five. Yes. So if you were doing this with a real user, that would work. But you're doing it with a bot called Zybooks. So it won't. Okay. Does that answer your Kev question, Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm completely okay to answer them. And it doesn't have to be about the labs. It could be about whatever else is going on in the class at this time. Is it okay if I mention the method I use? For what? For which? For this lab? For one of the labs. Yeah, you can mention it. Okay, it was um, four points, I think it was one five. Okay. I used a method called replace. Okay, so let's look. Four point one five. And what was the method you used? Replace. Ah, yes. Replace is good. Very good find. We, uh, yeah. Yes, you can use replace. Replace does, um, yeah, replace does what we're doing in that loop. That's the way they want you to do it, but yes, you can use replace. I mean, we've already learned about it in strings, and um, absolutely. I have no problem with that. I think it's actually a more efficient solution. Is it okay if I link a video that I found on it? Um, if you want to share it with the rest of the class, that's fine. Um, yeah, you can you can put a link up here to the video in case people want to see it. Although I don't intend on playing it. No. Cool. It's just talking about the replace method. Okay. I think that's a very good find, Kevin, and I think that that will work perfectly. Huh? So, are there any other questions? Going once? going twice. Okay, everyone, I hope that this was helpful. I'm going to stop the recording and stop sharing my screen and this will